90% of my classmates from medical school do not practice in this country. And it's the same, not just for doctors, for nurses. The other day, we were looking for a physiotherapist for one of our clients, and we could not find a physiotherapist. They've, many of them have left the country. So you can't build a strong healthcare system without a healthcare workforce. Yes, you can't build a strong workforce system without a strong healthcare workforce. Nigeria's Minister for Health and Social Welfare says Nigeria's healthcare workforce is about 400,000. That is grossly inadequate for Nigeria's healthcare needs. Nigeria, a country of vibrant cultures and diverse landscapes, with over 220 million people, faces a stark reality in its primary healthcare system. Despite being the 11th largest oil producer in the world and possessing extensive natural resources, Nigeria's primary healthcare system is struggling to meet the needs of its growing population. The importance of primary health care cannot be overemphasized. It is the critical foundational piece for any healthcare system. There is no successful healthcare system that will not have a vibrant primary health care platform, for lack of a better word. The, the reality is that there has to be the right foundation for healthcare, and primary health care is that foundation. And in every community, any society, that access to the essential basic elements of primary health care are critical to anyone that is accessing the system. In fact, you can argue that the well-being of a society is directly proportional to the robustness of the primary health care that is available within that society. While over 550 new centers are being built to meet the rapidly expanding population, it is unclear if the promise of the Muhammad Buhari administration to fix up 10,000 centers was actually kept. This raises concerns about whether everyone in Nigeria can get the health care that they need. However, come the 2000s, people began to canvas for more, more investment in primary health care because we're seeing poor health outcomes, uh, maternal and child health outcomes were becoming dire, even more dire than the, the countries in, same countries in West Africa and low and middle income countries. People began to canvas for investment in primary health care. And so we began to push for more investment in healthcare, and then we, the Nigeria came up with the National Health Act, which became the legal uh, backing for administering healthcare in Nigeria. But between the past decade and now, how have we done? I would say that we, I believe we have fallen short. Our expectations, for example, the Abuja Declaration in 2018, established that we were to invest up to 15% of our GDP in healthcare, particularly primary healthcare. But at, as at today, we're at a paltry 3% of GDP. Our primary health centers are unmanned, our healthcare workers are leaving the country in droves. And frankly, we're, we, we're, we haven't achieved what we set out to achieve. And some of the gains that we had in the 1980s, um, unfortunately, have been lost. Delivering effective primary health care services in Nigeria is no small feat. The landscape is vast, the infrastructure is varied, and the challenges are manifold. However, there is no challenge that is insurmountable. The Federal Ministry of Health says Nigeria has almost 33,000 primary health care centers which make up most of the country's health facilities. But this isn't enough for the over 220 million people living in Nigeria. And when you break down the numbers, this equals about 15 centers for every 100,000 people, with a physician attending to over 5,000 patients. A stark contrast 
with the World Health Organization's recommendation of one doctor to 600 patients. Somebody is supposed to work with 10 other healthcare providers and is working with just two. It means that the person is you know, short staffed. So you are being overworked. You can also break down and then you are not able to come to work. And there's a higher risk of having misdiagnosis, meaning that you are not okay. And there's no way you can give your best. You can't give the best healthcare delivery to your patient as the case may be. All right. So uh, um, people get discouraged and then they leave the country as the case may be. And the cycle continues. And at the end of the day, if nothing is being done, in another two to three years, you just come to the hospital, you won't see a qualified doctor to see you. That's number one on the healthcare provider. Then we'll move to the patient's side. They come to the hospital and they stay longer hours to be able to assess the healthcare. Um, this can also be very discouraging to them. And then they uh, develop this poor health seeking, uh, you know, kind of um, lifestyle. And some of them go about patronizing the quacks. And at the end of the day, they don't get the health care that they want. The majority of the existing healthcare centers are mostly government run, often dilapidated and under equipped. But critically, they are Nigeria's first line of defense against disease and illness. Many lack essential medicines and equipment, leaving patients to face long waits and uncertain outcomes. The challenges remain immense. Chronic underfunding plagues the system, leading to empty pharmacy shelves, expired medications, and the heartbreaking sight of people pulling meager resources to afford treatment. In regions with the fewest primary healthcare centers, child mortality rates are highest, immunization rates are lowest, and mothers are forced to embark on desperate journeys seeking care for their sick children. What happens here when it comes to funding is that especially funding is usually put in a way that it is an inverted pyramid, not your traditional pyramid that is up to, upside down, where a large chunk of funding go to structures and infrastructure that are tertiary level because those things are capital intensive. A lot of money goes there, and a lot of the professionals are at that level, and it's top heavy professionals, and the, their wages are high relatively. So, you see, a lot of funding goes into there. So, our financing mechanics around that become disjointed because most of the population we have to manage and make sure they have good health and well being at the bottom. And primary health care, because of that politics of governors and holding on to apron strings of primary health care across their, their, country, their, their, their states as of national level, they underfund primary health care. And because they underfund primary health care, primary health care cannot have the infrastructure, cannot have the quality of services that it can use to deliver. Funding cannot be effective if we do not have the right data to support policies and planning. According to Farm Access, of the over 33,000 primary health care centers, it is estimated that only 20% are functional. Most of the primary health care centers cannot provide essential health care services. Regarding the barriers to our primary health care services, there are several, several factors and they're all tied to resources. They're all tied to resources. We're talking financial resources, staffing, medical knowledge, medical expertise, and even you can go further to talk about community involvement. An average primary healthcare center needs to have a good level of staff involved. The place needs to be adequately funded the environment needs to be medically conducive. There should be the right medical equipment available, access to medications. The staff in the setting need to have access to other healthcare professionals who can help them when they run into problems, when they have questions that need to be answered and also when they need to escalate 
to a higher level of care. We are always looking for data. You're looking for data in a community. Where are you going to find it? Your primary health center is your key, right? There's something that we call the world, so the World Health Committee within a community. They liaise with primary health centers. They're like the connection between the primary health center, the health system, and the community. So what we do is to use that committee to access the community. But at the end of the day, the information that is gathered still has to pass through the primary health center. So the primary health center tells us, for example, how many children are being immunized, how many children do we even have in this community under five? And what is the proportion of that, um, that population that is being immunized? That information, you can only source it from the primary health center because that's where you administer the vaccines. For example, for example, you're asking, what are the prevailing health conditions in under fives in this community? Where are you going to find it? It's in your primary health center. So if the data collection is flawed from the get-go, then the data that you derive from that community will be flawed. If the data we're deriving from our communities is flawed, then we're making decisions based on the wrong information. In the words of Geoffrey Moore, without data, you are blind and deaf and in the middle of a freeway. There is no better way to put it. When it comes to policy making and decision taking, Nigeria needs to redefine its approach to data collection, especially in this age and time. The world has moved to electronic health records, has moved to health information systems, and a lot, a lot of parts of this country we've lagged behind. We're still using pen and paper, frankly, to get patient data. And how sustainable is that? in this day and age. If you look at even the, uh, the health information management system, where are we with it? At this time, a lot of countries, you look at countries like Rwanda, there are countries that have gone to the level where their primary health care system is driven by technology. Their health information management systems start with even profiling each person. And the minister at a dashboard can be able to see an aggregate of issues in primary health care facilities in this country. You know, things like the electronic medical record system, they're already there. They're not high polluting things. They're not rocket science. These are the real reality of it. But you see, the challenge here is that we like grandiose pro projects. So if you have a, somebody who wants to show he has a, has a constituency project, he would rather go and build probably a very large hospital. If he does a primary health care facility, he'll probably come. I, I went one time I doing a, a visit in somewhere, one of the states in South South, with members of the House Committee on Health. We went and saw somebody came and built it, and one primary health care facility opposite another one, practically adjacent to another one that existed. It's a large clientele. All he needed to do for that community was to revamp, to improve the infrastructure of that facility. He didn't be rather put a new structure. And the community were not going to a new structure, they were going to the old one that they were familiar with. This is the state of Nigeria's healthcare sector, a system in crisis, yet vital for the nation's well-being. But behind these stark realities lies the stories of dedication, unwavering resilience of the Nigerian healthcare worker. Join us next time as we take a critical look at the numbers behind this crisis, exploring the stories of those who are working tirelessly to bridge the gaps and ensure that every Nigerian has access to quality primary healthcare.